It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's featured speaker, my good friend, I'm proud to say, the Utah Governor, John Hudson. John Huntsman has had a long love for learning and is a great advocate for foreign language study in the United States. You all will be proud to know that he's fluent in Mandarin and is a, a great admirer of the Chinese culture. His initiatives have helped Utah students develop a proficiency in Chinese and also in other languages. His administration is also focused on early childhood learning and teaching, uh, teaching is a very important part of his state. Prior to becoming governor, he served as U.S. Ambassador to Singapore under President George H.W. Bush and has also had senior appointments in Commerce and the State Department as well as service as Deputy U.S. Trade Representative. He is truly an outstanding governor of Utah. He currently serves as chairman of the Western Governors Association and is on the executive committee of the National Governors Association. He is a Republican. I am a Democrat. <laughs> and I want to tell you that he has my deepest, deepest respect. It is this kind of Republican and this kind of Democrat that should work together for the better of this country. He is a seventh generation of Utah. He's immensely popular in his state where he won re-election on November 2008 with 77% of the vote. I ran twice in West Virginia, and if you'd added both times together, I don't think it would have gotten to 77%. <laughs> now, this is what shows what kind of man he is. His wife, Mary Kay, and he have seven children, including, including, and I've met both of them, two adopted daughters, one from China and one from India. Ladies and gentlemen, give the governor a great warm welcome. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's, it's an honor and a delight to be here with you uh, to offer a couple of thoughts on uh, Chinese language and uh, our commitment to Chinese language. And uh, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, Gaston C Caperton, uh, a great public servant in his own right for being a great friend for many, many years, and, uh, and also for being a great leader and role model in his current capacity. I want to thank Vivian Stewart, with the Asia Society on whose board I sat many years ago, uh, and many others who were dedicated to the pursuit uh, and learning of uh, the Chinese language. I thought it was only appropriate, knowing that I was going to be with Governor Caperton, to come up with a good aphorism to kind of describe who he is, because he's kind of getting up there in years. I've known him for a long time, but he's getting up there in years a little bit. And I, and I found a good aphorism that I wanted to share with you. It goes something like this. <laughs> now, I have, to, I, have to, I have to translate that for Gaston. It, it goes something like this. The old horse in the stable still runs 1,000 li. 
Now, a li is basically the, the, the Chinese equivalent of, um, of about a half a kilometer. Uh, there's another way, Gaston, of saying it, and that is basically the older the ginger, the hotter the spice. Maybe you can, <laughs> maybe you can relate to that one. Now, I, I want to thank so many of you who are educators because what we're trying to do in our state, and I'm so delighted that we have representatives from both higher ed and public ed and, uh, and our critical language working group, uh, and I want to thank them for being here and the work that they've done in helping to get our state focused. We're trying, like never before, to institute programs for young kids that will make them lifelong learners. Now, why is it important that we begin creating lifelong learners? Well, when our kids step out of school and they, when they begin to step onto the world stage, and I say the world stage is anywhere on this great planet of ours because we're such an interconnected, globalized uh, economy, they need to understand the world. And moreover, they need the skills that will allow them to be competitive regardless of what they choose to do. And we know full well that the kids these days, and I would say that in China things are probably roughly the same, particularly along the eastern seaboard where there are many, of, many opportunities. Our kids are going to have three, four, or five different jobs during the course of, of their career. And they're going to need to be fast on their feet. They're going to need to be uh, uh, studious and inquisitive and curious, regardless of where they go. So what is important for us and our teachers in our schools is to begin at a very early age to make our kids lifelong learners. Something that also is important, as far as I'm concerned, is teaching them the critical languages or an introduction to the critical languages in the world today. And it doesn't take long for anyone, regardless of where you live, to understand how important the Chinese language is. Now, I want to thank those who helped me acquire the Chinese language, both at the university level and, and even before that, when I lived in Asia almost 30 years ago, and I've been uh, a student of Chinese language and culture ever since. And it has done something for me that is very important. And I've noted that for all the young people with whom I come in contact, studying a language does something magical. It opens the mind and it allows them to understand and embrace differences. Now, we all come from different cultures, and our cultures speak to differences, different issues and different values, although most of our values are very much shared and they're in harmony with one another. But as young people come up, they need to be able to build bridges across the Pacific Ocean that speak to world peace, that speak to prosperity, that speak to economic development, that speak to cures for human disease that take far too many people on both sides of the Pacific. And I know no other way of doing that, building those bridges and unlocking the mysteries of the mind and making the cultures on both sides of the Pacific comprehensible other than through language study. And the sooner that we begin on both sides to understand our respective languages and encourage our young people, particularly here in the United States, because we don't have a lot of young kids studying Chinese, where in China there are a lot of young kids who are studying English. The sooner that we can get on with that, I am convinced, the better they're going to be during the course of their lifetime. But there are other reasons as well that are mighty important for us to be focused on the Chinese language, and we'll use that as an example here today. And I'll just speak to ethics and values just to begin this conversation, because I'm often taken back in my role as governor, believe it or not, in a state that is far, far away from most other destinations, I'm taken to Confucius thought. Now, I never would have been introduced to the notion of Confucius thought were it not for the acquisition of Chinese language. And I know we have some very good people here from the Confucius Institutes around the country, and we're very proud to have a Confucius Institute at uh, one of our great uh, universities in, uh, in, in Utah. Confucius, or Kung Fu Tzu, was born about 551 BC in the province of Shandong. 
which is famous for mantos and famous for baozes, some of my favorite food. Now, what Confucius left behind is at the core of life and culture in not only China, but also in Korea and in Japan and Vietnam. It is between the three ways, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, Dao Fu Ru Jiao, that he expressed simple and political teachings. For example, to love one another, to honor one's parents, to practice reciprocity in social relationships, even morality in government, virtuous leadership, so we fast forward history a little bit to 300 BC when Mengzi systematized Confucius thought. And during the Han Dynasty, Confucius thought actually became the official state political doctrine. And later it became part of the civil service exam. In other words, public servants for hundreds of years after the period of Confucius were expected to abide by the Confucius Code. The universality of ethics and virtue. Now, how much better would our world be today? How much better would our political system be, our day-to-day -day lives, regardless of where we call home, if we practiced just a little bit more in the way of Confucius thought when it comes to ethics and virtue? So how is it then that we get these notions of ethics and virtue into our younger generation to enhance and to improve their lives? Well, to my mind, it is through language and through language acquisition. Language opens the doors of the mind and it cracks foreign cultures. So we have had a state foreign policy in Utah that has been a very interesting one. So first and foremost, I would argue that there is a whole cultural dynamic that is gonna be extremely important across the Pacific for both young kids in the United States and the younger generation in China. And learning the Chinese language will be a significant investment here in the United States in terms of cracking that cultural code. The second point that we're discovering in our state is there's a significant economic component to our relationship across the Pacific. When you look at all of our exports across the Pacific, and a good many of them go to the China market, from 2003 to just last year, our exports of merchandise trade increased by about 90%. Now this is to say if economics are going to drive our quality of life in the United States and drive innovation, the acquisition of new ideas and new technologies, then economic engagement at a global level is going to be increasingly important. And we are driven across the Pacific like never before uh, uh, as we try to understand uh, many of those with whom we trade. Language is a huge head start in understanding the global marketplace. Number three, after we got out in the world a little bit and probably based a bit on my own preconceived uh, biases about uh, the significant destinations in the world and those that the younger generation will most likely have to deal with during the course of their lifetimes, we struck out with a so-called foreign policy as a state. Now, I know that states are not supposed to have foreign policies, and I've already apologized to the State Department for doing this, <laughs> but we figured that there were probably four countries of the world that would be extremely important for the next generation of Utahns coming up. You gotta remember, when people see the state of Utah, particularly from Beijing or Shanghai or Xi'an. They see that there's the Wild West out there and there's Utah and probably they're all the same. They all look the same and they all speak the same. They're a very homogeneous relationship. Well, I'm here to tell you that Utah is today the fastest growing state in America and our population is changing with lightning speed. We are very much becoming a heterogeneous population and our needs are many in terms of global engagement. So as we got thinking about the very important countries with whom the next generation will want to engage, we chose four. Mexico, because of proximity and flow of people. Canada, because it's a significant destination for bi biotechnology and, uh, and the extractive industries, both of which are prominent in my state. 
and China, because China is China, <laughs> and India, because India is India. And you look at the world stage for what it is and try to determine where it's going to be in the next 20 to 40 years, and you can't help but concluding that China is going to be a significant part of who we are here in America. And after we developed these four bilateral relationships with our state, we struck out with educational ties with all four of them. We struck out with cultural ties and connections and economic ties as well. So today we stand four years later with a set of four very important relationships for the state of Utah. And I'm here to tell you that our citizens and particularly our younger generation, I think have benefited enormously from that extra level of global engagement that they have had access to. Probably none more important than the inclusion of Mandarin Chinese in our public school system. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this because I know it's a sensitive point. And did I receive a letter or two from a German teacher or a French teacher to say that you're diminishing some of our languages and you're enhancing others? No, we're not trying to diminish any other languages. All we're trying to do in our state is to say, we're well into the 21st century. We understand that the post-World War II period was significant for all kinds of reasons, and there were languages associated with that period that were critically important for forward movement in the United States. And now as we kind of get into the 21st century, we look around the world and we see maybe two or three different languages that are critically important for the younger generation. And again, I would say none more important than Mandarin Chinese. So we have taken what was a situation about four or five years ago where we had just a couple of schools offering Mandarin Chinese to a few dozen students, nothing significant nothing that was in any way considered a priority. And we also came to find that our public school system didn't have a critical language coordinator, which we now have, and he's sitting right over here at one of these tables. Well, we got to work in making first and foremost the decision with public education that languages, believe it or not, are gonna be a critically important driver in educating our young people. Math and science and all the traditional uh, classes, of course, are extremely important, but if you really want to get serious about bridging the cultural divide that for so long has plagued the United States with other nations of the world and begin to make use on both sides of that bridge for good for both our people, then language is going to have to be part of that. And let's start young and let's begin to build up. We got the best people we could find. We put together a critical language advisory board which has done some good things in terms of making recommendations longer term. We chose Mandarin Chinese and we chose Arabic as two languages that we in our state would focus on for the next many years. And uh, I'm sure a lot of kids are going to be able to thank their teachers and those who made decisions in our state office uh, for the legacy that they are leaving behind. So four or five years ago, we had a little bit to show for it. And let me tell you what we're going to have in our next academic year. 82 schools in our state, 82 schools will offer Mandarin Chinese to about 6,000 students. Now you gotta understand this, you know, starting from nothing and you're moving in a direction that is quite significant. And when I look at the numbers, I say Utah, which has come practically from nowhere, is now leading the nation, and you can look at the numbers yourself, leading the nation in terms of the kids at the public ed level that we are introducing to Mandarin Chinese in real numbers. And we're very, very proud of the progress that we are making. But what is truly heartening to see is when these kids sign up for language classes, there are lines out the door, down the hallways, parents who are interested in seeing their kids study Mandarin Chinese and who want their kids to understand the world. It isn't just about studying Mandarin for the sake of studying a great language, it's about understanding the world and the parents get it and they want their kids to move forward. And it wouldn't be possible without the assistance of 22 international Chinese guest teachers who will be part of our academic landscape next year as well. Hanban, they call it, our friends from Hanban. So all of this has been seen with students at the junior and the high school level. And next year, 
we will have nearly 500 students in a Chinese dual immersion program in eight elementary schools, if you want to see how serious our state is becoming. So for these kids, the world is being opened up. And let me just give you one example. One of the things that I have noticed as I sit in the capital in, uh, in our state are the kids as they are exposed to languages. I see, I see the wheels turning in their mind. And recently I had some students from a little town called Payson, which is a town of about 12,000 people, largely uh, agricultural, although it's changing very, very quickly. Their high school there has about 1,100 students, and they have a thriving Chinese language program in their high school, 12,000 people in this town. And these students came into my office not long ago, and what is it that they wanted to do with the governor? They wanted to play stump the governor in Chinese. I never thought I'd see it as long as I lived. And the kids came in with big smiles on their faces and they wanted to use a few phrases on me to see if they could find something that maybe I couldn't respond to or to somehow <laughs> embarrass the governor. And it really was quite a remarkable thing to watch. So we're moving forward. We have uh, ambitious plans, but the plans that we looked at and considered funded and supported four or five years ago are now becoming a reality. And they would not be a reality today were it not for our very dedicated public ed professionals, people who understand language, people who understand the importance that language plays in the lives of these young kids, the teachers, including some of those from Hanban, who are inspiring these young kids to want to learn more. And guess what happens to these kids as they're introduced to the language and as they begin to speak a little bit of it, their minds open and they want to understand the culture and they want to understand the geography and the politics and the economics and the history of China. And it all kind of comes together in a most remarkable way. So let me just congratulate you and thank you for doing what you're doing here. Because I know this is a rather extraordinary gathering. And all I can tell you is keep it up. Because of our state, which traditionally has not been famous for its Chinese language at the public school level. If we can make the kind of progress that we have, if we can begin to turn the corner in terms of making language study, and in particular Mandarin Chinese language study, a priority, I think most of you can too. So if you're teachers, if you're administrators, if you're friends from China, go back to your respective leaders and spread the enthusiasm and the importance of studying Mandarin Chinese. That's all I ask you. Because I can tell you, the more that we do this, the more that people recognize how Utah is positioning itself for the future in comparison to all of the states around us. And we're getting credit for it. We're thinking ahead, and I think that's important to a lot of people. So in conclusion, thanking you for everything that you're doing. Let me just say, during, during the Han Dynasty, there was a, a very important, uh, there was a very uh, uh, important tradition left behind, and it was a tradition of philosophy and thought and city-state building and political science, and it went from about, about 200 BC to about 200 AD. I mean, one of the most interesting and progressive periods in, in China's history. And there was a phrase that came out of that period. It went something like this. When the family is happy, then all is well under heaven. I think our goal should be nothing short of trying to make our family, respectively, on both sides of the Pacific, happy and content and prosperous. And I'm here to tell you, if we can achieve that, then all will be well under heaven. Thank you so very much for having me here. Thank you.